I'll tell you what, guys. This has been a really good week for pro wrestling. All of the TV shows have been phenomenal this week. I really liked Monday Night Raw. NXT was good. Dynamite was surprisingly really, really good. SmackDown was fun. Um, enjoyed that show. And then Collision was okay. I wasn't terrible. It wasn't amazing, but it was fine for what it was. And then also I got to watch the NXT show last night, No Mercy, and that was a really, really, really great pay-per-view. This has been one of the better weeks in all of wrestling, and it's capped off from, with AEW Wrestle Dream. This is the first annual Wrestle Dream show. It was a tribute show to uh, Antonio Inoki, the legend, the founder of New Japan Pro Wrestling, and there were tons of tributes not only to New Japan on this show, but to other to other uh, forms of wrestling and history. We're going to talk about that here today on this review. Welcome to my recap review of Wrestle Dream. I'm just going to say this, yo. When it comes to in-ring matches, when it comes to matches, when it comes to um, having just a variety of great just work and great entertainment, this was the best AEW pay-per-view of all time. All Out 2021 may have been the most historic. Revolution 2022 may have had the best overall matches or Forbidden Door from last year or maybe even this year. That one was a great one too. But for me, for my money, this show delivered a hell of a lot more than I thought it would. And there were so many great matches that were all different from the other ones. Capped off with a huge ending with the debut of the former Edge, Adam Copeland, coming to AEW using his Alter Bridge song, which is not property of WWE. It is... Um, that's something that he actually worked out with the band himself. That's why he was able to come out with that song. So, um, very, very fun show. There's a lot to talk about, y'all. So, sit back. I'm going to give you my thoughts on it. And I'm going to do some analysis on the show. Uh, so, I want to talk about the uh, the pre-show. Because even the pre-show, the Zero Hour, was good. Um, they opened up with a lot of talking. And then the first match that we actually got was... Satoshi Kojima from New Japan teaming up with Keith Lee, Athena, and Billy Starks. It's men and women combined. It's a mixed tag um, or an intergender tag, whatever. Versus Shane Taylor, Lee Moriarty, Mercedes Martinez, and Diamante. So this match was just a cluster muck when it comes to just putting random people together. There was no story to this at all. Uh, Keith Lee teaming up with Kojima is a cool idea, but it just came out of nowhere. And it's almost like Tony Khan looked at the wrestlers that weren't that were available but didn't have any matches and just smushed them all together into this match. They worked hard. It was okay. Uh, it was a quick match. Didn't take that long. Everybody had their moments, but it wasn't meant to mean anything. However, the next match on the Zero Hour did mean something. Claudio Castagnoli versus Josh Barnett. I really love this match. And I love Josh Barnett. I've been a fan of Josh Barnett for a long time, yo. Even during the days when he was in Pride and UFC, he's one of those guys that is able to do both mixed martial arts and pro wrestling. And he's one of the guys that, unlike what Ronda and Shayna did at SummerSlam, where they failed to do it, Barnett knows how to take the MMA catch wrestling style and sort of blend it in with worked professional wrestling. So that was cool. Um, he is so good. The Claudio match, I enjoyed this match so much. It was the first match of the night where John Moxley did commentary. And let me tell you, John Moxley was hilarious at commentary, yo. He's sitting there giving his analysis, but he's also, he's also cheering on the guys that he's like commentating for. The Blackpool Combat Club. Well, make him pay for that shit. Like, he was funny as hell on the commentary. But this match was great. They delivered a nice little, um, you know, a and again, this match was allegedly booked within 24 hours notice. So that's makes it even better. But they did a little bit of catch wrestling, a little bit of MMA style stuff mixed in with Claudio's sort of strong power style. Claudio did win the match, but the beautiful part was after the match was over, Barnett cut a promo. And this was basically very similar to what Brock did with Cody at SummerSlam, except Barnett talked a lot more. Barnett even looked like Brock. He had like the beard and everything. So he basically said that, you know, he's heard a lot about Claudio, but now that he's been in the ring with him, he understands it. And he's like, everyone's right about you. Like you are great. And Barnett said, you know, he came into this show with no expectations. He's a local guy in Seattle, but he has huge respect for Claudio. This did more for Claudio, I would say, than a lot of other things have in AEW. 
And now Claudio's pretty much cemented along with the rest of the Blackpool Combat Club as baby faces. Um, and, like they're kind of tweeners, but now they're mostly baby faces. And uh, it was great. Like it genuinely was a really fun little match. I wish it was on the main card. Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne. This is very interesting because at the end of the show, Nick Wayne turned heel and joined Christian and Luchasaurus. So watching this match was like thinking about it now that the whole show is over is weird because they were fighting. It wasn't like they were just goofing off. They were fighting um, and Luchasaurus one with a nasty looking lariat. So I don't know if this was the initiation. I don't know if the story is going to be that Nick Wayne joins up with Christian, you know, during the show. But it's weird that these guys were secretly aligned and now they're not. So I guess maybe maybe they'll explain on Dynamite. But that was weird. Then we had the acclaimed and daddy ass, which is, you know, the current AEW trios champions against TMDK. Um, and I renamed him This Man Doesn't Know because I don't know who the fuck DM, uh, TMDK was. People I was watching the show with told me they were at NXT, and I swear to you guys, I don't. I do not have amnesia. I do not remember these guys in NXT. Like, Bad Dude Tito, Mickey Nichols, like I, I or Mikey Nichols, I swear to you, I don't remember who these guys are. I do not know who they are, dude, but somehow... A typical AEW, you know, bad booking. And this show was well booked, but there's still some bad booking here. We're going to get into it. These guys just get a title shot. We don't even know who they are. And when you introduce people from other companies or from Japan, not every fan knows them. I think AEW assumes too much that every fan knows who everybody is. And there's a lot of people AEW has access to in New Japan, in Ring of Honor. They've worked with Impact before, Triple A. So you've got this giant pool of talent and not everybody watches Ring of Honor, man. In fact, a very small number of people do. Hell, hardcore fans, I'm a hardcore fan. I don't even have time to watch Ring of Honor. We just don't have time. We have to work and other things. We have families. But the match was okay. I mean, the rap was kind of fun. They used some puns for their old gimmicks. The Acclaimed obviously won. This was done more so to warm up the crowd for the real AEW Wrestle Dream show. They also did a thing on the pre-show where Tony Khan had the red red sort of scarf that Anoki wore and kind of gave a tribute to Anoki with Anoki's grandchildren. So that was very classy and I appreciated that. All right, so then the main card of Wrestle Dream, they had like a rotating panel of, of commentators. You had Excalibur Taz, and then you had Nigel McGuinness, then you had Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross and uh, John Moxley joining in, so they kind of rotated the crew, and I actually liked that because it gave each match sort of a different feel. So they opened up with what was supposed to be a tag team title match two on two, but Adam Cole was hurt in New York. MJF, the AEW World Champion, versus the Righteous to retain uh, he for the ROH tag team title, and he won. He won the match to retain. I don't think people understand that. First of all, this match was a lot of fun. MJF busted out all the comedy. He did some stuff from the 80s. He did the kangaroo kick. It was a lot of fun, very well put together. But first of all, the righteous being in this position, again, very few people, very, very few people at all know who the righteous are. I'm sorry. And they got like a phony sort of like wannabe Wyatt family thing going on. I actually like the guys. I'm not even saying they're bad wrestlers or I don't like the gimmick. I really do like enjoy the gimmick, but they were in this weird position and I feel like they were kind of buried on this show. You have to understand, even though MJF is the world heavyweight champion, even though he is a great wrestler, to take a one guy and to have him beat two guys in a handicap match, that hurts the two guys, especially since one of those guys being um, Dutch, the big guy, is over 300 pounds. Like, it just, it's it's very weird. It felt like these guys were an afterthought and a joke, and their credibility is even lower than it was before because they couldn't even beat one guy. And yes, MJF is the champion. I mentioned that. But the era, like back in the day when you would have one versus two matches, like Andre the Giant doing handicap matches or King Kong Bundy, it was only against no-name job guys. Guys that were just not superstars. The Righteous are actually an act. They're an actual act in Ring of Honor. And now, what do they mean? 
they mean even less in my opinion. So that was weird. I expected like someone to help MJF win, but he did it on his own. So hey, it is what it is. The next match was Eddie Kingston versus Katsuyori Shibata. Now, this match, each of these guys had titles. In fact, Eddie has two. And one of the problems of AEW that pisses me off is there's way too many titles, dude. Not just with the AEW belt and the Ring of Honor belts. You've got belts from Mexico and Japan being defended. It just it, it When you have that many titles, it doesn't mean anything. The titles don't mean anything, man. They really, really don't. And so the story here was that... Shibata, well, first of all, Shibata was the ROH Pure Champion. Eddie Kingston, why does that belt even exist nowadays? It doesn't make sense. Eddie Kingston was the ROH uh, World Champion and New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong Champion. Again, guys, it's just they got to get rid of some of these belts, yo. They really do. Like the Young Bucks being the trio champs of Ring of Honor with, with Adam Page, it's so weird. You know what I mean? It's such a weird thing. Like, I'm not against it necessarily, but are they really going to go work Ring of Honor? Are they really going to be on that web show? Like, they're like the EVPs. They're like the guys who founded the company. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but I think ROH as a brand needs to just, needs to be folded, in my opinion. That's my opinion. You disagree, that's okay. I like this match a lot. Eddie Kingston is not the best at doing all Japan style wrestling, but you can tell he's a hardcore fan because every one of his matches, he'll bust out something from Kobashi or Junakiyama, who's his favorite, Misawa, Akira Tawe. Uh, there's so many guys over there. Uh, even some of the gaijin, like Vader, um, Stan Hansen, you know, legends. Eddie Kingston loves all Japan, and it showed here. Shibata, another guy who I absolutely loved, yo. In 2017, 2018, right around that time frame, maybe 2016, I was all over Shibata, and when he got hurt, it was a real bummer. I'm glad he's back now. Kingston did win the match, but this match was really meant to be like a tribute to Inoki. The whole show was, but this really felt like it. Then we had Chris Statlander and Julia Hart. Now, they were put in a pretty bad position because the Kingston Shibata match was really, really good. It was a phenomenal match. However, the Chris Statlander Julia Hart match was decent. I enjoyed it. I really did. It um Julia Hart has, I love her presentation, the music and the entrance. I like that a lot. Statlander's pretty damn awesome, but the match was pretty good. They, they traded holds back and forth. They did some uh, some decent moves here and there. Some nice reversals. Some gruesome moves. Julia Hart's like a very thin, petite girl. And she doesn't have like... Like you would think that she would, she would get injured easily. But she's pretty tough, man. Chris Statlander won the match with the Sunday Night Fever and retained. She hit a tombstone. Jumped up and hit the, uh, the other Sunday Night Fever. So... The thing is, man, I've complained about how AEW does tombstone pile drivers and they don't mean anything. I was so happy this was a three count. When you have a pile driver or a move that drops you on your neck, like the one winged angel, for example, whatever, any move, it can definitely hurt. It can definitely hurt the move if somebody does not if somebody kicks out. That should be the end. Those moves should be super dangerous, and they are. And that should be the end when somebody gets hit with them. So I'm glad that this match kind of followed that on. So then we had this really wacky spot fest of a match. Very different. Again, I mentioned at the beginning of the review, this show had a lot of variety. This is to a number one contenders match where I guess they could earn a shot at any point. I don't know if that means like money in the bank, but Young Bucks versus the Guns versus the Lucha Bros versus uh, Ray Phoenix and, um, I'm sorry, He's the Lucha Bro. And versus Orange Cassidy and Hook. So the Young Bucks won. Lots of, there was some comedy there. I love how Orange Cassidy, who, whose gimmick I think has been played out for a while, for this match, when he had his hands in his pocket, he just pulled them out quickly and started hitting. Like, I love that. Like, I love that now he's taking it a bit more serious because the gimmick was kind of running its course. But him and Hook kind of work well together, you know, as a team. The Young Bucks won the match. Again, you can expect all kinds of spots here that you're familiar with because the Young Bucks and Lucha Bros has been a legendary AEW feud going back to 2019. They've had tons and tons of matches. So the Young Bucks winning, I'm sorry, the Young Bucks and Lucha Bros, they always deliver. 
every single time they deliver. In fact, I think this week on Dynamite, if I remember right, Nick Jackson's going against Ray Phoenix. It could be Matt Jackson. I always get them mixed up. So the feud, it's not really a quote-unquote blood feud right now, but the rivalry between the Lucha Bros and the Bucks. I was there live at the ladder match in 2019. There was a cage match in uh, uh, All Out 2021. Uh, they've just had so many matches, those trios matches with Pac and Kenny. Um, that's like a legendary AEW feud, and they have so much chemistry that you're going to get good stuff out of them because they know each other so well. So it is what it is. The Bucks really weren't cheered that much on this show. And I wonder why that is. Like, genuinely, are people getting tired of them? Or, or I, I don't know. They just weren't as hot as you would expect. Now, the next match I thought was like, to me, this was, as I was watching it, it was the best match of the night up until this point. This was a main event anywhere in the country. And I loved this match so much. This match was everything I love about pro wrestling. Swerve Strickland versus Hangman Page. The There's a lot of different styles on this show. This show had a lot of variety, and I loved it all. The lucha work from the Bucks and, and the Lucha Bros. The Japanese stuff from Mo, from uh, Moxley, from Kingston and Shibata. The classic yet also modern tag team style of FTR. Um, Zack Sabre and Brian. We're going to get to these matches in a minute. Um, their European-American hybrid 70s Billy Robinson, Vern Gagne style. Lots of variety on this show. And then, of course, the main event was just, you know, crazy, brutal garbage match. But my favorite style of pro wrestling is character-based story matches. And that's what Hangman versus Strickland was. This is, go out of your way to see this if you didn't see it. And if you did see it, watch it again. Swerve Strickland has money written all over him. This guy's got main event charisma, main event talent. In the ring, he's great. He's a great talker. He has a he knows how to execute moves. He he has a great look. He has confidence. Like he's got that it factor. He's got that intangible that you can't teach. He's got it. And Hangman Page, one of the better baby faces in AEW, super likable guy. They had a great freaking match that told a story. You know, the early part of the story was that Swerve was kind of dicking around with Hangman. And then Hangman got the advantage and was like, yo, don't underestimate me. Because I think Swerve thought that Hangman was going soft. And as the match progressed, um, they started hitting their finishers or, or trying to, but they failed. Swerve Strickland hit some nasty double stomps. There was one that he hit where Hangman was nailed on the apron. There was a spot where Licky broke his arm. He didn't. He was okay. Um, but man, what a story they told. Without question, this is the biggest win in Swerve Strickland's career. So what ends up happening is, at one point, Prince Nana comes out, right? And what happens is, after that, Strickland hits a 450 on, on Paige's arm that was injured. That was a phenomenal spot. And then what happened was, he um, he was going to do the N the uh, NML dr J JML driver, excuse me. And then um, Paige reversed. And then uh, Strickland hit a German and tried to stomp him again. But this time, Hangman moved, hit the buckshot lariat. But then he was selling his arm because it was the injured arm, which is a great, great story. This is a story, man. This is wrestling storytelling right here, yo. This is the kind of shit I like when matches tell stories like this. That's my favorite type of wrestling. So what happened was, and we're going to talk more about that later because they ain't the only match that did it. What happened was um, the referee... Chris Nana gets ejected by the referee, and while the referee's being distracted and Hangman, Strickland grabs the crown, nails Hangman with it, hits two more of the sliding kicks to the head, the house call. That's a nasty finisher, by the way. One, two, three. Strickland is elevated now to upper mid-card main event status. You know, he just beat a former world champion. Triple H and Sean have to be totally, like, irritated. They don't have him under contract anymore because... Hit Row was his group, but even without Hit Row, Swerve Strickland is a main... Keep an eye out for this guy, bro, because if he doesn't headline AEW, he will headline WWE. This guy's got everything. He's got all the tools. What a great show so far. I love this AEW pay-per-view, man. This might have been the best AEW pay-per-view in-ring from an in-ring perspective, maybe ever. Ricky Starks... Versus Wheeler Yuta. I really felt bad for them because they had to follow that match. But one of the things they did pretty smartly is that they started off pretty slow. 
some chain wrestling here and there. Wheeler Yuta, to me, is just boring. His his character's boring. Not a bad in-ring guy, but he has no gimmick. He's not a great talker. He doesn't have that interesting of a look. He's just a guy. He's just a guy to me. I'm just being honest with you. He's just a guy. Of the Blackpool Club, he's the weakest link in the group. And then you've got Ricky Starks, who has a ton of charisma, went toe-to-toe with MJF on the mic once, and Ricky Starks is the heel? Not to me. So this was great. Ricky Starks ends up winning the match, and um, he hit basically the Rojambeau fall after a spear, and he won. There was some interference from uh, from Big Bill, because that's Ricky Starks' guy. But uh, it was... It was not a great, great match. It was a good match. This would have been a solid dynamite main event or collision main event since Ricky Starks on collision more. It's a fine TV main event and a fine match to have on the card, but nowhere near the tippy top of what was on this show. There was a lot of great stuff on this show, including what happened next. Brian Danielson, Zack Sabre Jr. This is a clinic. This this match right here is a, was a complete and utter masterpiece. Brian Danielson, I have said, is, to me, the greatest in the world. It's him, Will Ospreay, and he's coming up. And boy, was Zack Sabre cemented into that, into that list. I mean, wow. This match was supposed to happen at Forbidden Door last year. I actually bought a ticket to that show thinking it was going to happen. It didn't happen. It was a very expensive ticket, by the way. So... The Seattle fans got it here, and holy moly, what a great freaking scientific clinic this was. This felt like nothing we've seen in a long time. It was very similar to that match between Pete Dunne, a.k.a. Butch, and Noam Dar, where they had the European-style catch wrestling joint locks, the style that was popularized by guys like Vern Gagne in the 70s, Billy Robinson. Um, Regal and Finley used it a little bit. Um, oh, there's so many guys. Uh, Steve Wright. Go look up Steve Wright. Go to YouTube after you get done with this review and type in Steve Wright Wrestling, which is Alex Wright's dad. This guy was a phenomenal chain wrestler. They did a lot of that stuff in this match. Lots of holds and reversals. It was so different from anything we see on American television. And like I said, it was like the Noam Dar Pete Dunne match, except this one was a bit more polished. We saw Brian bust out stuff like the cattle mutilation. Zack Sabre was able to reverse a lot of his stuff. The story here was that Brian was trying to out-wrestle Zack Sabre, but Zack Sabre was able to reverse everything that he did, which wound up basically frustrating Brian to where he had to finish the match off with the flying knee, the bombaye, because he couldn't submit him, he couldn't out-wrestle him. So he says, screw it, I'll hit him with the flying knee, which it is a win. You are kind of out-wrestling, but nevertheless... It's a thing where the story made sense. And honestly, I want to see these guys wrestle again a hundred more times. Okay, maybe not that much, but they got to do more matches, dude. Because it was just, this was so damn good. It was a beautiful hybrid of European style and American style. And again, like I said, you're not going to see this kind of stuff anywhere. This is what I think Monday Night Raw should be doing. Stuff like this where you have each match, you have a different feel. This past Monday, you had Dragon Lee and Dominic, and you had that crazy main event. It was a great show. I like different styles. I like wrestling to be a buffet table where you get a little bit of everything. That's the best wrestling to me. And Wrestle Dream delivered. I have been critical of Tony Khan's booking because I don't think he's that great of a booker. He's improving, though, because Dynamite was a great show. Dynamite had a great cliffhanger ending. But the, the, the wrestlers, the talent, elevate the company. Like, this company would not be what it is if it wasn't for the incredible talent roster they have. So, again, Brian, Zack Sabre, I don't even know what more I can say about this. Just spectacular, phenomenal. Nigel McGuinness was incredible on this match, explaining all the moves. I already knew it because I've watched European wrestling before, but I'll bet there's a lot of people who have never seen this style before, at least executed quite like this. This is a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece. Absolute masterpiece right there. It was great. It was great. So then we had the six man, which I thought was going to be the second to last match. Takeshita, Sammy Guevara, and Will Ospreay, Don Callis' family versus Chris Jericho and the Golden Lovers. This was a nice little match with six 
very talented people. Literally, you had all you had in this match Will Ospreay, Kenny Omega, and Chris Jericho all together, and Kota Ibushi, and you had Takeshita and Sammy, who were younger, not quite as seasoned, but still could hang in there. Man, this was a lot of fun. I mean, they they went back and forth. We saw tribute some of their previous matches. Um, there was a moment in the match where Ibushi freaking like Ibushi transformed. You know what I'm saying? Ibushi, strangely enough, to look a little bit pale. Like, he's looked pretty pale lately. But anyways, so the finish of this match was pretty cool. So Jericho was going for the Judas effect. And what happened was Will Ospreay, he was going to hit it on, on Sammy. Will Ospreay kind of pushed him out of the way and got nailed. And then what happened was um, Osprey was, I'm sorry. Yeah, Osprey uh, first Jericho had... Sammy pinned after um, a Hurricane Rana, but what happened was the the other guys were on the outside being held from from getting into the match, and then Don Callis got I don't know if it was a baseball bat or an umbrella like what he I couldn't tell what it was, but he hit he he ran in and he hit Jericho, and then Guevara got the one two three, so the heels win the feud will continue, and uh, it should because. Obviously, you have a lot of different feuds going on. You've got Kenny and Osprey's feud that, you know, they're one and one Forbidden Door and Wrestle Kingdom. You've got uh, Jericho and Osprey. They had the all-in match. You've got Jericho and Sammy Guevara. You've got the Golden Lovers getting beaten up by Takeshita. You've got Takeshita and Kenny. Like, there's a lot of possible matches they can do, rematches and, and so on and so forth. But, um... Seeing Jericho and Omega work together was cool. You know, going back to that awesome match they had in New Japan, the Alpha and the Omega, and of course, the first AEW pay-per-view ever had them headlining, so it was a very poetic thing to do. Uh, I enjoyed it. Then we had a match that I thought did not... This is this shouldn't have been here. This should have been earlier in the show. Maybe even the pre-show. FTR, the best tag team in the world, versus Aussie Open... For the AEW tag team titles. Not a bad match. I think it went on way too long. The crowd was dead for this. Because they had just got done seeing. Four great matches. One after another. And two of which were really great. And one was like a classic. You know when you see Brian and Zack Sabre Jr. And they're not closing the show dude. Like how are you going to follow that? And while I give credit to Aussie Open and FTR for working so damn hard because they did. This was bad match placement. That's why match placement for pay-per-views is so utterly important. The co-main event of this show, if you're going to end with Christian and Darby, which they did because of the debut of Edge, I wouldn't have done that other than the Edge debut, but if you're going to end with that, you, you should have the sixth man be the co-main event or Brian and Zack Sabre be the co-main event because this match, like I said, a good match. FTR cannot have a, a bad match. They, they, FTR cannot have a bad match. But, my God, this is just bad placement. There was a super shatter machine finish, but throughout a lot of this match, I was just kind of hoping the show would end. The issue is that these AEW pay-per-views go long, and so if you end up near the end of the show, unless you're super over or if there's like a big storyline or something, it does, be, like the crowd does begin to fade. Remember, it's like a five and a half hour show if you include the pre-show. And some people traveled to get there, they had to find parking, like, I don't blame them. I think a good pay-per-view is about three to four hours. If you go past that, you're starting to risk the crowd getting tired. And the crowd was absolutely tired for this one. Absolutely tired. What can you do? You know, what can you do? So then the main event, Darby Allen, Christian Cage, TNT title, two out of three falls. This was brutal. Darby Allen is going to end up in a wheelchair someday. I know I say it all the time, yo. Uh, he's... He's nuts. He's nuts. They each went up one fall apiece. At one point in the match, like Darby got the, the early pin, but at one point in the match, they had the steel steps outside. And they did about three spots on the steel steps that I swear I thought Darby had broken his back. Like your, your body, no matter how small you are, how tough you are, is not meant to be 
jabbed in the back with the sides of stairs. Have any of y'all ever slipped on like stairs and like the stairs hit your knee and you, you slice yourself open or it just hurts? Like, you know, like when your kneecap goes right into the corner of the stairs, you know, the part that's like hard. Dude, it's so painful. Darby was getting thrown around like a rag doll here. Christian is probably on one of the best runs of his career. Easily. Tremendous heel. Tremendous work from Christian. But man, Darby... Uh, it's a pay-per-view, so at least, and it's in his hometown, so at least there was a reason for it, but I still think, like, my God. Oh, I should also mention that the, um, I forgot to say that during the Don Callis match, somebody painted, like, the Last Supper, and Callis was Jesus in the middle. That was pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome. So what wound up happening here was, at one point, Christian, like, rips open the ring, like, just rips it. This, go out of your way to see it. Rips open the ring, and they tease like a bunch of different things on it. What ends up happening is that outside the ring in the front row, Buddy Wayne's widow slash Nick Wayne's mom was there. Nick Wayne comes down to the ring. They tease Nick Wayne and Darby teaming up on Christian. Nick Wayne's got TNT title. He turns around. He whacks Darby. Christian gets the one, two, three, and retains the TNT title. Then... Everybody knew Edge was coming, but before then, Sting comes out to try and save Darby. This was very mistimed. It was almost like Sting came out late. He just walked out there. He didn't even run. There was like it was just really, really mistimed. When he got on the apron, I think he was supposed to hit Luchasaurus sooner, but he didn't. And again, they were off time, and that's bad. And what happened was it looked kind of you know Mickey Mouse-ish, but they were able to fix it shortly after that. It didn't look that bad. Um, and then they, the Luchasaurus comes up and they all jump on Sting and Darby and they just lay everybody out. Then they cut to this uh, car driving up and somebody getting out of the car. And of course it was Edge, Adam Copeland coming out with the Metalingus song uh, from Alter Bridge. The crowd went absolutely nuts. He gets in, the, they did the pyro and everything. He gets in the ring. He's teasing with the chair. He's going to whack Christian. And uh, I'm sorry. He's teasing with the chair. With the chair he's going to whack um. Uh, uh, Darby, but instead he hits Christian, saving Darby. No concerto. Edge shakes hands with them, and and that's how the show ends. So big, you know, happy moment for the crowd. Uh, people were very happy about it. Edge, I didn't think he was going to go to AEW. I thought he was going to retire in WWE at WrestleMania because he is getting up there in age, but he's got a bit more of a run left in him. And he's saying he wants to, he said in the press conference he wanted to wrestle new talent he had never worked with, worked with before and contribute. So I hope that he will do that. He's not like CM Punk where he's out of his mind. He probably will genuinely help the company out. Uh, and I love Edge. I mean, from 2000 to 2010, that was my favorite wrestler. He was the MVP of wrestling in 20 from that from that for that decade, and uh, that is what it is. So in ring, this show was phenomenal. You got tons of variety, something for everybody. It was a great, great pay per view. Got to give AEW credit. I hope that Tony, you know, really humbles himself and starts to dig into to getting better at putting out putting on shows. I hope that Brian and Edge help him, and I hope that we see a lot of good stuff from AEW. I don't hate AEW. Tony Khan has pissed me off and annoyed me in the past, but I want them to succeed, and I want all wrestling to be good. And We've had a great week capped off by this pay-per-view, so go out of your way to see it. It was great. Those are my thoughts. Thumbs up, show. Thanks for watching. See you soon.